In the name of God, our way, our truth, and our life. Amen. Amen. I will never forget my visit in 2010 to my ancestral home of Beilstein, Germany. My family's coat of arms dated 1399 shows that the Bielsteins were an ancient family of good, sturdy stock. <laughs> the turned knight's helmet, which sits upon a castle, reveals that the Beilsteins were landed gentry some of whom served in the military as knights and soldiers to defend the town and surrounding territory if they were attacked by some foreign invader. And they had no choice, had to fight. You see, the men and their families had taken a solemn oath of fealty to go to battle when their feudal lord called upon them to do so. And while the men were out fighting, the women and children uh, were tasked to watch over the home, hearth, farmlands, and livestock until the men returned. Now, Beilstein is not an easy town to get to. It lays in the southwest uh, part of Germany. And so Libby and I, to get there, we flew into Frankfurt. We took a train to Kohlberg, and then another train to Kotchum, and then take a cab. <laughs> for the 20 or so minutes uh, to Beilstein. And I think at this point we've been traveling something like 30 hours. <laughs> it was a beautiful ride on the winding road uh, that ran alongside the Mosul River. It was during the cab ride that suddenly the road curved around a bend and there uh, sits the town of Beilstein right on the Mosul. Now, Baustein is one of the most well-preserved medieval towns in Germany. Its original co cobblestones still run up and down the streets. It is also a town that sits at the bottom of a really, really steep hill. It was almost like it had been cut out of the rock to form a lush uh, valley. And Libby and I learned while we were there that Baustein is known, best known, uh, a, for its beauty and history and castle ruins, and B, for its wine. <laughs> A Beilsteiner Riesling. Very good wine, actually. You can see all along the hills, vineyards upon vineyards of grapevines uh, used for the production of this wine. And these vines are not a new thing. The first vineyards in Beilstein were planted and cultivated into wine by the Romans. Rome occupied parts of southwest Germany, uh, even making the city of Trier, which is a short train ride from Kachum, and made Trier their capital in the region. And now Trier is also a city on the banks of the Mosul River, and it too lies in a valley between low vine-covered hills near the border of Luxembourg and within uh, the important Mosul wine region. Trier was founded in the first century BC as Augustus Treverorum, the city of Augusta for the Emperor Augustus. And Trier happens to be Germany's oldest city. It has one of the oldest bridges um, that Rome built in the country. Inhabitants of the city and the areas leading to Beilstein were the homeland of a Celtic tribe named the Treveri. They were conquered and displaced by the Romans. Thus, Beilstein contends the ruins of Roman settlements as far back as the first century. And so, in addition to being part of an army, my ancestors would have certainly been farmers day laborers or wine makers, people tilling and tending the land, producing food and wine for the town and its residents. They would have known exactly what Jesus was driving at when he said uh, and made this metaphor, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. 
every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. So they would have known, had a good idea of what Jesus was talking about, but so would the people of Judea. Vineyards were an industry that had been carefully cultivated throughout the country for centuries. And it was a crucial, it was crucial for it was a cash crop. Does anybody know what a cash crop is? Okay, <laughs> neither did I. A cash crop, it means that the grapes and wine produced were planted for the purpose of selling it on the market or exporting it to make a profit, using the Mosul probably, no doubt, as a means of transport. That's opposed to a normal crop like grain or vegetables, which were raised purely for consumption. In talking with current Beilstein residents, we learned some things about the wine industry that we did not know, which makes wine tasting and visiting vineyards one of Libby's and my favorite uh, things to do. And this is what we have learned. We have learned that it is not easy to grow grapes and make out of them good wine. It is not easy. The vines are a very rugged crop in a way, but in another sense, it is a very delicate fruit and requires being treated with kit gloves. A young vine is not permitted to bear fruit for the first three years. It is therefore, uh, is drastically, they are drastically pruned in December and January to preserve its energy. The branches that do not bear fruit are cut out to further conserve the energy of the plant. If this constant cutting back was not done, the result would be a crop that was not up to its full potential. So you're probably thinking at this point, gee, Joan, that's very interesting. <laughs> but so what? <laughs> well, here, here, here is where it is important for us to put on our thinking caps and for us to imagine that we are standing in the shoes of my Baustein ancestors and the Romans. By using a well-known commodity uh, of his time, the vines, the branches, and their good fruit, Jesus, in this gospel passage, is speaking to us um, the same timeless, timeless message. First, this message being, we must bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Good fruit, productive fruit, always striving to reach our fullest potential as Jesus' disciples. We could do this by living out our baptismal covenant and pruning our words and actions so we can be vehicles of God's peace, compassion, generosity, hope, and love. Second, this message means there is, there is such a thing as an unproductive life. There is such a thing as an unproductive life. One of my favorite authors is Parker Palmer, who is a writer, speaker, and activist who focuses on issues in education, community, leadership, spirituality, and social change. In his book, Let Your Life Speak, he describes in some measure what an unproductive life might look like. He writes, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, vocation does not come from willfulness. It comes from listening. We must listen to our life and try to understand what it is truly about, quite apart from what we would like it to be about. If we don't do this, our life will never represent anything real in the world, no matter how earnest our intentions. So listening, very important. Another quote, we need to understand the perverse comfort we sometimes get from choosing death, choosing death in life, exempting ourselves from the challenge of using our gifts, of living our lives in authentic relationship with others. And lastly, the message, of the vine and the branches means we are called to cultivate a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
We are called to abide in him as he abides in us. We are called to confess that Jesus abides in God, and so we must abide in God. We must strive to know and believe that God loves us, and therefore we are called to love one another. My friends, Jesus shows us with his words and actions how we are to live a productive life, living up to our highest potential, like the good fruit that grapes can produce. I close with a question uh, Parker Palmer asks in his book, Let Your Life Speak. It's a profound one. He asks, is the life we are living the same as the life that wants to live in us? I invite each of us to pause and listen to our lives, listen to God's voice, and ask ourselves, is the life I am living the same as the life that wants to live in me? And if we don't ask these questions, if not, I pray we can turn to Christ and invite him into our lives and trust that if we follow him, we will find within his way, his truth, and his life so we can bear good fruit for God's kingdom here on earth and for the kingdom of God that is to come. Amen.